Last week, we started a new sermon series, and I'm really, really excited about that. And, and I see a lot of new faces. I see a lot of faces I haven't seen in a while, so, uh, which is really, really cool. Thank you guys for being here. Um, so I'll kind of give you the idea of what our new sermon series is, um, but it's called Simple. And for a while now, I've been feeling God just kind of um, tug me in a direction. I, I didn't really know where we were supposed to go. I love to preach in series. I think we, we build upon each week. Um, and so God was, was speaking something to me, and I probably just wasn't listening the right way because I'm not going to put it on God. I'm definitely going to put that on me. And then I started having conversations with people like, you know, just, hey, you know, where do you think I should go? What do you, I'm I'm thinking about this, thinking about this. And I thought about this one person and this one person has an an amazing redemption story just of, of kind of being away for a while and just God bringing them back to, to himself, bringing him back into church and, and using him to, you know, bring other people. And so it's just been this really cool story. So I said, hey, what do you think I need to speak about? What do you think that people need to hear that are on that journey that maybe haven't decided to fully commit their lives? I mean, like, you know, they're, they, they, Jesus is their savior, but like, what would make somebody just kind of take that leap of faith? And so we talked about that. Um, I, I gave them about a, a week or so when we, when we met back up and, um, Little did I know, they actually kind of had a sermon prepared, right? So they gave me the short of the sermon, uh, and I was like, wow, that's, that, you, should, you should think about doing this, right? Um, so like we, we talked about it, we talked about some different points and things, and he, and he gave me a story. And I was like, you know what, that's it. And that's where God kind of put all these puzzle pieces together about uh, this concept of simple. And so this whole thing, what I'm trying to do is to pick a story that we probably all know. We probably could all tell the story. Like last week, we started at the top. It was David and Goliath, right? I mean, come on. That one, pretty much everybody knows David and Goliath. Uh, This week is another story uh, that most of you guys know. But to look at those stories with different eyes, and I love to dig in theologically. I love to get deep and, and extrapolate really cool stuff out of there. But God just kind of impressed on my heart, what would it look like if we were to just go simple? If we were to just read these stories that we could almost recite and pull some simple truths out of there and some simple applications and some ways to know, hey, this is how God wants us to live. And so therefore, we have this sermon series, Simple. So today, you're like, come on, get on with it. Today is simple Jesus walks on water. Pretty simple. We all know the story. Now, we also sometimes call the story Peter walked on water, but I think really the, the, the bigger of the story is Jesus, of course, walking on water. So I want to I set this up. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 14, uh, I want to kind of set up this story and tell you the context of what's happening. So uh, John the Baptist, you guys know who that is, right? John the Baptist, okay? He was a pretty popular guy back then. Um, he had a really famous cousin. Who was his well-known cousin? Jesus. Okay, so Jesus was John the Baptist's cousin. John the Baptist was older, maybe about six months or so. Um, John the Baptist is beheaded, right? He's killed. He was imprisoned, and then he was beheaded. Jesus hears about it, and the Bible says he privately withdraws to a solitary place by boat. So Jesus was going to get some alone time, right? Why would Jesus want some alone time after that? Because he was sad. His cousin had just been killed. So he goes into a boat. He goes to withdraw to the solitary place, but the people follow him. So why did Jesus get in a boat? Well, probably because he wanted to go away from land and like thinking, you know, maybe people would leave. That's that he would go out in the boat sometimes, cross over to the lake and, you know, come kind of surprising and they wouldn't know. Otherwise, if he went by foot, by foot the crowd would just kind of follow him. But it, it, it appears in the text that the crowd kind of watched his boat go out and they followed his boat and they followed to where he was. Um, so they, why did they follow him? Because they wanted him to heal the sick. They wanted to see miracles. Um, and then a very, very well-known 
something happens at that point when he hits land and a bunch of people show up. Does anybody know the story? I'll give you a hint. It's the feeding of the... You guys are awesome. All right, so it's the feeding of the 5,000, right? And then, so, okay, great, you know, one kid has like a, you know, a filet of fish sandwich meal from McDonald's, and they break it up, and they, you know, they have all this, this 12 baskets left over and all that. And the disciples, they're like, you know, we got we to gotta send these people away. And Jesus is like, no, 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 they need to stay. But remember, Jesus was trying to get some alone time. And the people came, and, and, and Jesus said, no, 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 they need to stay. We'll feed them. Which leads me to believe that Jesus loved and served people even in, quote, unquote, bad timing. And uh, translation, all timing is good timing with God. There is no bad timing with God. There is no, uh, God, I know you're busy. I know you got some stuff going on. You know, there's a little old me down here. No, no, no. All timing is good timing with God. So Matthew chapter 14, verse 20. This is basically right at the end of the feeding of the 5,000. So Matthew 14, verse 20, it says, they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up how many basketfuls? 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. So back then, they, when they did the counting, they counted men. There were also women and children there. So there was probably more like fifteen or 20,000 people. So if you're like, well, you know, if Jesus broke it into really small chunks, he could have fed 5,000. No, there was probably like fifteen or 20,000 people there. Verse 22 Immediately, it's a weird, strange word that's used there. Jesus, and then this next word is important. What is it? Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Now, pause for a second. My mind goes, okay, did they take the 12 baskets of food along with them? Right? I'm like, because like, when I go on the boat, I got to have snacks and stuff. So like, that, that's where I would go, right? So... But this word made says immediately, so it's showing it's urgent that Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Now, that word made, the original word, it means to compel or force with urgency. So something's going on here. And and again, when we read on our own, don't just read to cover the text. Read to find words like this and go, Why in the world would Jesus make them get into the boat right then, immediately? It's because they had an appointment. The disciples had an appointment with a storm, and Jesus knew it. And Jesus was sending them out into a storm. Verse 23, after he had dismissed them, that was the crowd, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. So here's Jesus. Now he's going to get his alone time, right? That's why he was there in the first place. And if you look back in verse 13, it says, when Jesus heard what happened, that's talking about his cousin, John the Baptist, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. So back to verse 23. Later that night, he was there alone. So he was up on the mountain. Jesus was alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now, I need to explain this, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but the Sea of Galilee is some very, very interesting terrain. The Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long and about seven miles wide, so it's not really big. You can stand on one side. You can see the mountains on the other side of it, okay? So it's not real big. So it's a lake. We think of it as, okay, it's a nice little placid lake. Well, you probably didn't know, but the Sea of Galilee is in about 700-something feet below sea level. So it's something really weird happens. You've got mountains kind of surrounding the Sea of Galilee. You've got the Mediterranean Sea right over, and these storms would come, and the storms would blow over the top of the mountains and rush into this valley where the Sea of Galilee was, and hot air would meet cold air, and we know what happens then, right? Bad things happen really fast. So it would be this gorgeous, beautiful day, like you could be out water skiing on the Sea of Galilee, and next thing you know, there is this massive storm that's like a deadly storm, huge, huge waves that would flip boats over, and we we know what that's like, right? And so, like, that happens so fast over there. 
But Jesus knew that, didn't he? It says Jesus made them go and get into this boat. Why would Jesus do that? Because they had an appointment with a storm, as we said. Now, theirs was a a real storm, a weather storm, right? They didn't have meteorologists, and, well, they're not right anyway, so I don't know what good they are. But they had an appointment with a weather storm. And we talk about this a lot, but we have storms in life. We have things that are very unexpected. We have things in life that just are negative and put us in peril. They're treacherous, and they happen almost instantaneously. One minute, things are, it's smooth sailing. Things are going just fine. And the next minute, it's like we're, we're, we're in a world of chaos. And, and, and we look at it, we're like, what is going on? What, why am I in this storm? And we all face storms. We can't avoid them. This is not a perfect world. Of course, God created perfect. Who messed it up? We did. So we've got this world that's broken and hurting, and it has sin, and it has pain, and it has disease, and it has trouble, and it has stubbed my toe all the way to, you name it. That's the world that we live in. So we encounter storms. So in Jesus' goodness, what does he do? He allows us to go through storms. Sometimes the storms are are little and, and, and they're not too difficult to get through. But what does that do? It grows our faith. And then we reach a bigger storm where we don't know what we're gonna do. So why did Jesus make them go into the storm? A lot of people like to blame everything on the devil, right? I mean, like, oh, it was the devil. The devil made the storm. While that sometimes could be true, we have to realize there's a lot of other reasons why we hit storms. We just talked about one a minute ago, just because we live in a fallen world. Because, well, you walk outside of these doors and there are issues in life and things. I I love... um, there was this guy, he founded Gospel for Asia. His name is K.P. Yohannan, amazing speaker. I, I read one of his books. Um, we actually got to see him speak in Miami at a church up there. Um, and he was talking about this, just talking about just people always looking at the storms in life or looking at their problems and, and blaming it on the devil. And he says it like this. He says it tongue in cheek, and he's, he's from India, so he's Indian, so he's got this really heavy accent. And he says, the poor devil get blamed for everything right? And that's true. He does it better than I do. (laughs) But we try to blame everything on the devil. And guess what? That's not theologically accurate. There's a lot of reasons we have storms. Again, we live in a fallen world. It could be the enemy trying to get us into something. It's just by chance. Um, I want to say this with all gentleness we do dumb things sometimes, don't we? Some of you guys are like, me, 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 me. Okay, that's me, right? Okay, we do dumb things and we get ourselves into trouble. One of, one of my, fa- I don't know if I should say this in church, so I'm going to anyway, but one of my favorite phrases that I, I keep hearing recently is play stupid games when, you said stupid in church. It's all right. Play stupid games win stupid prizes. We get ourselves into trouble sometimes, and we want to blame it on the devil, and God's going, um, bro, you did, I don't know if God says bro, but he's like, like, you did this on your own. Like, you got yourself into this trouble. So that might be why we're experiencing a storm. But the kind that we're going to talk about today is the kind of storm that God sends us into on purpose. And you can be like, well, why would God do that? That's not a loving God. That's not what God should do. God should fix everything. No. And as we already said, God allows us to go through storms in life for a number of different reasons. I'll just straight off tell you the best. Sometimes you're never going to know. We've been in storms. Nikki and I have been storms in life that we don't know. God knows. Maybe it was to grow us. 
Maybe it was for someone else to observe us and God just gives us enough strength to get to it and to be a witness to somebody. So God allows us to go through storms and even sometimes puts us into storms to grow our faith. And then guess what? When our faith grows and the next storm comes, which guess what? I don't have to tell you this. This is not a newsflash, but there's going to be another storm. I'm a glasses half full guy all the way, but there's going to be another storm and it might be just worse than the last one. And if you had no faith that was grown from the last storm, you wouldn't be ready for this next storm because you're going to face storms in life. So God wants to use those things and grow us and grow our faith in a way that, again, we can be ready for the next one. We can be an example for someone else. We can learn from it. All of the above. Who knows what God has in store? I, I was thinking about it. I think there's three ways to get through a storm. There, there, maybe there's more, but I think there's three ways to get through a storm. Number one, you can get through a storm as a complainer, right? A anybody been there? Like, right, I, I, that, that's been me a lot. God, why am I here? This isn't, and then we use an F word, don't we? What, what is it? Say the right one in church. Fair. Okay, good. I was like... <laughs> That probably shouldn't have come out of my mouth like that because we're going to stop at stupid saying that one in church, okay? But we say, it's not fair. Boy, that's a cuss word in my house. Because when we say, God is, a, I, I imagine God's up there going, you don't want fair. You, you believe me, you, you don't want me to show you fair. Fair would have been my son not hanging on a cross. That would have been fair. But we complain. This isn't fair. I don't deserve this. God, you're not good. God, you should fix this. And sometimes we complain. So that's one way to get through a storm. Number two, we can get through a storm as a survivor. Now, this is me a lot. Now, I don't, I, I'm not saying I go through a lot of storms, but like, like this is probably where most of us live. Like, just, just God, I don't know if I can get through another day. I, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Like, God, please do something. I trust you, God, but I, I can't do it another day. And guess what? The next day comes, and that storm is still there. And then you're back at it, God, I don't know if I can do it another day. And you're just, you're surviving. And, and sometimes that's all we can do. Like, like sometimes, God, just give me the strength to make it to tomorrow. And that's all we can muster up. And that's oftentimes where we are. But I think there's a third way to get through a storm. I, 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 and it, this is, this is kind of one of those weird oddball things and you think, oh, maybe only like super Christians, if there is such a thing, which there isn't, only super Christians can get like this, but I think that we can get through storms as a thriver. I think that there are times, maybe not always, there are times in storms where we can thrive. There are times where we see God step in and be so real in our lives, be so present in our lives, even though we are in the middle of chaos, there is this, how's it called? Peace that passes all understanding. That's what God wants to give to us in storms. I want to give you an example of this. I, I heard this story years ago. Um, from Francis Chan. I was listening to a message of his. I think that he preached at a conference, and he told this story, and, and I've remembered it all these years, and so I looked it up and verified it this week. So here it is. In, in 2007, 23 South Korean missionaries were captured by the Taliban in Afghanistan. So 23 South Koreans were in Afghanistan being missionaries and they were captured by the Taliban. Now, if you know anything about 
missionaries, the Taliban, 2007, that was not good, right? That was bad. So, and in fact, while they were being held, two of them were killed. They were murdered by the Taliban before South Korea could make a deal with the Taliban and get the other 21 of them back. So this isn't like, a oh, they were captured, and, you know, but they were being well taken care of. No. Two of them were already killed, and in fact, it was two of the elders, some of the, the, two of the pastors, and they actually fought over who was going to get killed first. Who was going to go for, no, 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 I'm the oldest, I'm the more senior, they're going to take, I'm, I'm going first. And, and so this, this was real. And Francis Chan interviewed one of the missionaries after they had gotten back. I don't know how long it was after this. And here's what they said. They were, the missionary was saying, as they speak to the others, the other captors, the other missionaries that were captive, this is what they would say, quote, they tell me when I was surrounded by these soldiers, I felt the presence of Jesus in there with me. Now that we are back in Seoul, South Korea, I am trying to experience that intimacy with him, but I can't. I fast and I pray and I don't feel it. You ready for this? I would rather be back there because of the intimacy I had with him. (laughs) Probably the absolute worst storm that you could be in, knowing that your days were short. Because how long would it be for them to kill off 21 more people, not very long. And this person said, I felt God's presence so real in my life that no matter the storm that I was in, I would rather be back there. I believe, church, that we can live as thrivers in the middle of the storm. Now, I'm not trying to downplay what you're going through. I I, I, I never, ever want to do that. I know sometimes surviving is all you've got. And I get that, and I, I, I empathize with that. But I believe God wants us to thrive in the midst of storms. In fact, sometimes we work so hard to get out of the storm that we don't realize what God is trying to show us through the storm. Sometimes all of our focus is, God, get me out of this storm that we don't stop for just a minute and say, God, what are you trying to show me in this storm? And I just wonder how often God would go, ah, there it is. Okay, let me show you, and then let us out of the storm. I can't speak for God, but I bet God is just sitting up there trying to get us to understand what it is that he has for us. Back to our passage, verse 25. Shortly before dawn, now that's that we, we usually read from the NIV. That's my preferred version, but I'm not a version Nazi, okay? Um, in the King James or New King James version, it says something really interesting that I want to reference and come back to. It says, in the fourth watch of the night, okay? So shortly before dawn, it's, it's almost morning, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And, and as I was studying this, it just made me think, just because you can't see Jesus, because remember, they were paddling all night long. They were rowing against the wind, against the waves. They couldn't get, they couldn't get to their destination. So all night, almost morning, they were rowing. They're like, Jesus, where are you? You've left us out here. But just because you can't see Jesus doesn't mean he can't see you. Jesus sees us all of the time. So there's four watches, okay, uh, according to the Romans, and that, that was the time. This is how they were writing it. So the first watch was from 6 to 9 p.m. Now, they would have watches because they would sleep outside or there was, uh, you know, robbers or people, you know, dangerous people out there. So they would have somebody stay awake all night long, and they would take shifts, and they would, you know, be able to alarm the rest of them if something bad was happening. And so first watch... 6 to 9 p.m., sign me up for that one, okay? I'm a night owl. I could do that, no problem. 
Also, First Watch is a great restaurant. Anybody ever been to a First Watch? Dude, First Watch is awesome, okay? Like, if you think, like, good southern food mixed with southwest, you got to go. Okay, you got to try it. All right, so that's First Watch. Just had to cover that little commercial there. Second Watch was from 9 p.m. to midnight. Like, again, I'm a night owl, so Second Watch, no problem. I could do that easy, Six to nine, first watch, super simple. Nine to midnight, second watch, not a problem at all. Then we move to third watch. Third watch is midnight to 3 a.m. We're getting a little tougher, okay? Staying up from midnight to 3 a.m., that, you know, or trying to fall asleep and then wake up and stay up for that time and then fall back asleep after that, that you, you're, getting, you're getting a little more challenging there for third watch. But fourth watch... Fourth watch was 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Okay, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be, because again, I'm a night owl, so I'd probably go to sleep by about midnight, sleep for three hours, and then have to wake up and stay awake for three hours. That's probably not going to happen, okay? I'm just being honest. I'm not one of those guys that can stay up like that. So here it was. All night long, shortly before dawn, during the fourth watch, they had been rowing and rowing and rowing. Can you imagine being in a storm, waves coming into the boat? They were probably bailing out the boat. Jesus, where are you? Jesus, you left us. You you made us get into this boat, into this storm, and you left us. So question, why did Jesus choose to go to them during the fourth watch? Why couldn't he have gone, oh, maybe during the first, second, or even the third watch? Why did he choose the fourth watch? Because we said it already, because God uses storms to grow our faith and to teach us to rely on him more. (laughs) See, <laughs> pause for dramatic effect. This leads us to our first point, and they'll go quickly, I promise. Number one, simple followers of Jesus desire fourth watch faith. I want to have fourth watch faith. Again, first and second watch faith, no big deal. Like, Ah, the storm may not have been so bad yet. You know, like they hadn't have been straining. Third watch, that would have been tough. But fourth watch, can you imagine how tired they were? Can you imagine how sore their arms would have been? Can you imagine how much they felt like giving up? So simple followers of Jesus desire fourth watch faith. Did you know, although God is our comforter, and, and I, man, I, I, I count on that. I count on the comfort of God. His goal is not always for us to be comfortable. He allows us to be out of our comfort zone, and he's going to comfort us through that. But he allows us to be uncomfortable so that we will rely on him. You know how people say all the time, well, God will give, never give you more than you can handle. That's actually not theologically correct. God will give you more than you can handle. Why? So that you'll trust him. So that you'll rely on him and not yourself. Because guess what? You can't do it on your own. So if his goal is to change and grow us, Showing up late, showing up in the fourth watch is actually right on time. (laughs) I wrote this down. Fourth watch faith is not designed to bring us relief. It's designed to bring us revelation. Fourth watch faith, when when we've got nothing else but to count on God, that's not supposed to just bring us relief. It's supposed to say, Okay, God, you've got my attention. What is it that you are trying to show me? 
God, I want to grow closer to you. I want to learn from you. Even in this mess, even in my uncomfort, teach me, God. Bring revelation. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Now, I thought about talking about this verse. Not going to do it. I'm just going to leave it right there with you guys. Verse 27. But it, Jesus immediately said to them, there's that word again, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now watch this. Verse 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Whoa. Peter, what are you doing? We have a lot of Peter, what are you doing moments in Scripture, don't we? This might be one of the biggest ones. Peter, wh- why? Wh- why would you get out of the boat in the storm? This brings us to our second point. Simple followers of Jesus flip the what if. Simple followers of Jesus flip the what if. Remember uh, a, a month or two ago when we were talking about the, the worry and anxiety. And we talked about all of those what ifs that creep into our mind, usually around 3 a.m. Well, what if it is cancer? What if I lose my job? What if we can't be together? What if, what if, what if, and we always play all of the negative what ifs? What if we flipped the what if and put a positive on it? What if God's trying to show me something? What if God has something better for me? What if I am taking this uh, out of context or out of proportion and, and it's not as bad as it might be? Simple followers of Jesus flip the what if. So instead of thinking, what if I drown? Peter thought, what if I make it to Jesus? Wouldn't that be cool? What, what if I could get like, like because that's Jesus. I, I, I want to be with him right now. What if I make it? What would it look like, church, if you flipped your what ifs? What would it look like? Are all of those things that plague your mind, all those negative things, what if you flipped those backwards? And you made your what ifs a positive thing. (laughs) I was thinking about this. Peter was willing to make the storm worse, right? What? Let me let me say it this way. Was Peter safer in the boat or in the water? In the boat, right? I mean, common sense. Like I would rather be in the boat than swimming in treacherous waves. But Peter was willing to make his storm worse just to be with Jesus. What if we had that kind of faith? Back to verse 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. Wow. Wow. He flipped the what if. And then there's verse 30. It lasted one verse. I mean, we were doing so well, Peter. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. (laughs) Number three, simple followers of Jesus fix their eyes on him. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Because what did, what did verse 30 say? But when he, what? Saw the wind. That tells us he was focused on Jesus. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you. Jesus said, come. And I, 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 I bet Peter was like this, like keeping his eyes on Jesus and he steps, I don't want to step off and fall, that would be awesome. Okay, steps out of the boat like this and he's starting, he was actually walking on water and I bet he was so focused on Jesus and it says, but when he saw the wind, what did he do? He looked away. 
and we take our eyes off of Jesus. And whenever we take our eyes off of Jesus, what do we put our eyes on? The storm. Jesus says, that's not how this works. Was there still a storm when he was looking at Jesus? Was the wind and the waves still raging around him when he had his eyes on Jesus? Absolutely, 100%. The storm was still there. It wasn't, put your eyes on Jesus and your storms go away. Nope. The storm was still right there. But bad things started to happen when he took his eyes off. It makes me think of the old hymn, and I think I've used this before. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Like just, just completely full in his wonderful face. And I love this line. And the things of earth will what? Grow strangely dim. I, what amazing words that, that whoever wrote that, I don't know who it was. The things of earth, which would storms be in that category? Yep. Would good things of the earth be in that category? Yep. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth, whether they are good or bad, will grow strangely dim. Why? Because, as we just sang, nothing compares to Jesus. I couldn't have picked a better worship set today. The things of earth will go strangely dim. All of those things that distract us from Jesus, they'll just kind of fade into the background because we're focused on Jesus. And of course, we got to finish it out in the light of his glory and grace. So awesome. Simple followers of Jesus fix their eyes on him. Verse 31, immediately, there's that word third time in this passage, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little what? You of little faith. Wait a minute, he was doing, he had a lot of faith. He stepped out of a boat. But when he took his eyes off of Jesus, that's when Jesus said, you of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Like they didn't know it already, like they hadn't seen Jesus do so many things already. The wind and the waves died down, and that convinced them again. So three things that simple followers of Jesus do. Simple followers of Jesus desire fourth watch faith. I want to have faith where I will make it through watches one, two, and three, and basically to the end. Like, I want to have faith. I don't always do it. I'm pretty terrible at it sometimes, but I desire to have faith that takes me all the way through to the end where I don't start doubting God. God, I don't know if you're good anymore because I, you can't be good if I'm in this circumstance. That, that's, why would a loving God allow me to be in this? To grow us, to teach us, to show somebody else something. So simple followers of Jesus desire fourth watch faith. Number two, simple followers of Jesus flip the what if. Instead of thinking all of the bad things that could possibly happen, we need to think, hey God, what is it that you want from this? God, what are you trying to teach me? God, what can I learn from this? God, what positive things can come out of this. And number three, simple followers of Jesus fix their eyes on him. Whether they're bad, whether it's a storm, or whether it's the good thing, the treasures of this world, whatever it is, we've got to be very cautious to always focus on Jesus because when our eyes are not on Jesus, our eyes are on bad, our eyes are on stuff, and that's when bad things happen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you're a God who wants us to keep our eyes focused on you. God, that you desire relationship with us. God, that you desire the best for us. 
God, thank you that we know, and your word tells us that it pains you for us to suffer, for us to go through things. God, thank you that you are such a good heavenly father, such a better father than I could ever be, that you love us in such a way that you would allow us to experience some pain so that it will grow us so that it will teach us, so that it will help us the next time something comes along. God, thank you that we can understand that the goal is to grow our faith in you. And thank you, God, that you will do whatever is necessary to grow that faith. Thank you, God, that we know that your goodness does not hinge on our circumstances, that we don't look through the lens of whatever is going on in our life to determine how good you are. Thank you, God, that you have already proven how good you are by loving us even in our sin, by sending a perfect Savior for us. God, I know that there are some here this morning who do not have Jesus as their Savior, who have not made the choice to follow him with their whole life. God, right now in this moment, would you convict hearts, hearts that are far from you, whether they, they know you as Savior or not. God, right now in this moment, would you please speak to their hearts Help them to know their need for you. God, help all of us to have fourth watch faith. God, help all of us to flip the what ifs in life. And God, help us to fix our eyes on you. We thank you that you're so good. You are the great I am matchless God we lift up this time of offering God help us to be generous God help us to not give begrudgingly as individuals or as a church God there are so many areas that we want to support so many areas in this community and in this world so God help us as a church to be generous to reach out of our comfort zones, God, to touch people's lives in some kind of support in that they can see your love. God, open up opportunities in whatever way there can be for us to speak the name of Jesus into people's lives. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you that you were generous with us. We pray all of this in the awesome, matchless, mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.